How's it going everybody? I'm Lewis and we've got a new developer blog from the Oscar Runescape team. This is for Silver Jewelry and Poll49. Which is amazing to think because we're almost at 50 content polls. And that's not even every single poll we've had in Old School Runescape. So let's get straight into this developer blog by having a look at Silver Jewelry. In Old School Runescape we've got a lot of jewelry. Most of it stems from gold and our regular gems such as sapphire, ruby, emerald and diamond. But we don't really have much silver jewellery. Now not too long ago, a 2007 Escape Reddit user called LawmasterRS posted some ideas of what we could do with silver jewellery and the gems that we don't really use that much which are opal, jade and red topaz. You'll be able to enchant these bits of jewellery similar to how you can with uh, golden bits of jewellery. Using level 1 enchant for opals, level 2 for jade and level 3 for red topaz. The official ideas they've got for the jewellery are With an opal you'll be able to create a ring of pursuit which provides a 25% chance to reveal the entire path of an animal being tracked. This effect will only be triggered on the first step of tracking an animal. The expeditious bracelet which gives you a chance of a kill on a slayer task counting as two however no additional experience needed. Meaning you'll be able to go through your slayer task a little bit quicker and hopefully get your slayer points up faster. The dodgy necklace will provide a 25% chance to prevent a failed pickpocket from stunning or damaging you. And the amulet of bounty will provide a 25% chance to conserve some seeds when planting in an allotment patches. With jade, there's the ring of returning, which teleports you to your current respawn location. There's the flamtar bracelet, which will mean that every build you do at Morton Temple will subsequently become more effective. There's the necklace of passage, which will teleport you to the wizard's tower, the outpost, and south of the Desert Eagle's Eyrie in the Caridian Desert. And the Amulet of Chemistry, which gives you a 5% chance of a 4-dose potion being created while making a potion. Finally, the Red Topaz Jewelry, there's a Farate's Aid. This allows any attack to deal damage to vampires, and one charge is depleted per attack. Which should mean you'll be able to kill vampires a little bit faster than usual. There's the Bracelet of Slaughter, which will give you a chance of on a kill of a slayer task, not counting towards your task but still providing you with Slayer experience. This is kind of like the opposite of the Expeditious Bracelet, meaning that you can get the Slayer experience, but you don't have to worry about having to go back and change your Slayer task every time you kill another beast. The Necklace of Faith restores 10% of your total prayer points if your hit points fall under 20% of the total hit points whilst worn. And finally, the Burning Amulet, which teleports you to the entrance of the Chaos Temple, teleports you to the entrance of the Bandit Camp, and south of the lava maze. These are all some very interesting effects and many of them sound really useful. I particularly like some of the more basic ones that you won't really think of too much when trying to come up with ideas. For example the Ring of Pursuit where it gives you a 25% chance of revealing the entire path of a hunter creature as opposed to just getting the part. However I do feel that we've got to be somewhat careful that we don't make these items too powerful because for one they're only made out of silver opal, jade and red topaz which let's be honest we don't trade we just sort of drop on the floor there pretty much at what you could say some of the lowest prices in game. Obviously they'll rise if this update came out but are we all used to these items having value and I feel that that's something we've got to think about. However I do like the idea of upgrading them and I do like the idea of having these different effects. One of the good parts about this is a lot of this jewellery only gives you a chance of the effect being triggered. And out of the current percentages they've already suggested, I don't actually have any major quarrels with it. Usually I suggest they take things like a 25% chance down to a 10%, but really looking at what the effects are on these bits of jewellery, I feel that most of them are fine. The only one I have a huge, or well, not, not huge, but a bit of a, an objection against, is the Necklace of Faith, restoring 10% of your total pair points if your hit points falls under 20% of the total whilst one. To me it feels a bit strange however seeing it's only 10% of the total prayer points and it's only got one charge in itself then I think it'll be fine. It just might be a bit strange if someone's running around with an entire inventory of necklaces of faith just to restore their prayer in certain situations. But I highly doubt that's going to happen and if it does it's just going to be a little bit more funny than annoying. So on Thursday when they've released content poll 49 they'll be asking the question should it be possible to craft silver jewellery? Silver bars would be used with semi-precious gems, which are opal, jade and red topaz, to create rings, necklaces and amulets, and they've missed out bracelets there. When enchanted, these pieces of jewellery provide different effects depending on the gem used. I think by the time the poll comes out, I think I will probably be voting yes to that. 
Moving on to the blister rework. And this is quite an interesting one because it's quite a big change to what we used to in Old School RuneScape. A lot of the time in Old School RuneScape we will get an update and it pretty much stays the same. Here we've got a rework to an update we've had in Old School RuneScape. And it's kind of big because ballistas are fairly interesting weapons. But anyway, let's get into this because it's more about balancing them as opposed to making huge changes to them. Let's be honest, most people that want to use a ballista will use a heavy ballista, whether they're a pure or a main, and no one really uses light ballistas. With some recent changes to the way that the ballistas have been working, uh, most notably their attack speed and attack animations, people have been chatting about them, mostly because a lot of people, especially mains, feel that they've been nerfed. So they kind of want to aim, and I quite like this, the heavy ballista towards people that have main accounts, and the light ballista towards pures. So what will be the actual changes? First of all, the light ballista changes. To improve the light ballista, they're going to upgrade its stats to match that of the current heavy ballista in game. This means increasing the range attack of the weapon to 110. To accommodate for this, they're going to increase the range level required to use it to 65, as well as allow it to use all types of javelin. To improve the heavy ballista, they want to increase its range attack to 125 and its range strength to plus 15. Alongside this, the weapon would actually require you to have completed Monkey Madness 2 and have level 75 range to equip it. This would mean that essentially Pures wouldn't be able to get it because in order to do Monkey Madness 2 you have to go back to Apatol and get the defense experience. But it actually splits out the two weapons into two useful weapons. So mains will definitely be able to use the heavy ballista and Pures will be able to use the light ballista. The only thing I kind of don't like about this is the fact that we're taking the light ballista and making it essentially what our current heavy ballista is. However, seeing as it recently got nerfed a little bit, then it's probably not that much of an issue. So they'll be asking, should the light ballista and heavy ballista be reworked? The light ballista will be given 110 range attack and the ability to use all javelins. It would have a high requirement of 65 range to use. The stats of the heavy ballista will be increased to 125 range attack and plus 15 range strength. This will come with the additional requirements of 75 range and completion of Monkey Madness 2 to use. Personally, I think that this is a very interesting idea to update and actually balance out the ballistas. My only other concern is the fact that increasing the heavy ballista to 125 range attack and 15 range strength might make other range weapons seem a little bit useless. Especially when you consider the fact that the ballista has a speed of 3. Whereas weapons such as Armadillo's crossbow has a speed of 4, which to me doesn't quite make sense. I would imagine the crossbow to be a little bit faster than the ballista, but I suppose I can try and hope that the Old School Skip team have done a good job of balancing it, even if their track record in the past hasn't been too great. In fact, if you think that the heavy ballista should be a little bit slower, let me know in the comments below, because I think it'd be quite interesting to discuss that. Next in this developer blog, we've got the Halloween event as a free-to-play quest. This year's Halloween event, let's be honest, was amazing. I thought it was one of the best events we've had in RuneScape's history. As such, many people have requested for it to become a permanent fixture in Old School RuneScape, and the Old School RuneScape team would love to offer it as a free-to-play quest, which is amazing, because number one, we get a new quest, and number two, it's free-to-play, which encourages more people to join Old School RuneScape. Obviously, because it's no longer going to be a Halloween event, they would have to rework it slightly, but that's just mostly going to be removing the mentions of the fact it's Halloween and changing the rewards from the cosmetic killer's outfit to be 600 crafting experience, an uncut ruby, emerald and sapphire, as well as a quest point. Everything else about the quest would appear to be the same. So the Old School RuneScape team are asking, should the 2016 Halloween event be added to Old School RuneScape as a permanent free-to-play quest? This quest will reward 600 crafting XP, an uncut ruby, emerald and sapphire, and one quest point in place of the seasonal rewards. I've got no real objection against this, I think this would be quite good. I find it weird calling the event a quest, however it did have a quest-like structure and it was very fun to play, so like I said I've got no real objection of them adding it as a quest. Moving on in this developer blog to the Seer's Ring buff. The Seer's Ring is the magic ring you get from the Dagonoff Kings. However, there are a lot less people using it than the melee and range versions. And the Old School RuneScape team think a buff to its accuracy and defense would actually bring it more in line with those other rings and encourage people to use it a lot more. They want to improve its magic attack bonus and magic defense by 50%, making it a plus 6 in both these stats from a plus 4. They would also apply this 50% increase to its imbued form, meaning an imbued Seer's Ring will provide a plus 12 magic attack bonus and magic defense. 
So in the next content poll they'll be asking, should the Sears ring have its magic attack bonus and magic defense bonus increased by 50% to plus 6 in its unimbued form and plus 12 in its imbued form? This one I'm a little bit unsure about. I like the idea of trying to balance out the weapon, however it will definitely annoy me a little bit when I see that the Sears ring has a plus 6 bonus and the other rings have plus 4 bonuses, because remember that they still have plus 4 bonuses. That being said, the fact that magic bonuses don't really do that much, I think that this sort of buff is perfectly acceptable. Finally, in this developer blog we've got the other questions. Currently, some NPCs that you might expect to drop champion scrolls do not. Should champion scrolls be added to the drop tables of these NPCs? When you reach the maximum number of boss or slayer kills old school runescape can store, the number is simply replaced with locks, as it cannot get any higher. Should the number also be displayed alongside this? Now I'm not entirely sure which number they're talking about here, whether it's actually the number that they're tracking or the maximum integer value that is causing this issue. Either way, I think that could work quite well for players that enjoy having a look at their kill logs. Should a confirmation message appear when releasing stackable hunter creatures? This is an interesting little one because it seems like such a basic question, however I believe they polled something a couple of years ago very similar to this. The main reason that that failed was the fact that people in the wilderness that are say skilling for black chins or maybe even salamanders might try and drop what they've hunted to dissuade PKs from trying to kill them. Because let's be honest, skillers are only there for the XP, they don't really want to bother with all that PKing nonsense. So this is actually a much deeper question than when you first look at it. Should a shortcut be added to the fence next to the Tavli dungeon Lesser Demons? This shortcut will require level 63 agility to use. Should it be possible to convert Xerix Talisman into 100 Lizardman Fangs? The agility shortcuts found on the way to the Cosmic Altar are currently quite slow due to the number of obstacles you must pass. Should they reduce the number of obstacles in order to speed up these shortcuts? Should the Ring of Coins and Ring of Nature be made usable and tradable in free to play? Should the player-owned house Max Hit Dummy be made to account for the special effect of the arc light? Should the magic imbue spell icon be faded out when it's on cooldown? Should the respawn rate of Scorpio be reduced to 10 seconds? Should hill giants located in the wilderness drop giant keys at twice the usual rate? Should the payment required to use Shiloh Village Furnace be taken at the furnace itself rather than the door? Should a total level requirement of 2200 be added to two worlds? And they're open to suggestions of which worlds can have this requirement. Should they change all of the trouble brewing flags to be one-handed items? Should they add Kurasks to Relic of Slayer Cave? However, these will only be killable on task. Which will be quite useful for players that get Kurask tasks because a lot of people are going there to kill Kurasks and try and get the Leaf Blade Baslax. Which I actually got one of them when I was on my first or one of the first Kurask tasks since that update. On the boss and slayer kill locks, should each monster also have a streak counter with a reset button? The existing counters will be completely unaffected by this, but players will be able to reset their streak counter on demand to track individual streaks. Magic boosting prayers currently only affect magic attack. Should this be changed to also increase magic defense? Should they remove the need for fairy enough certificate to get to the fairy queen after completion of fairy tale part 2? Currently your kill count is displayed within barrows, should they change this to show your percentage towards the maximum potential rewards? Which would be a huge change to barrows, however incredibly useful. And finally, should the construction skill cape perk be changed to unlimited player and house teleports? Something we had before, then was changed to 5 because they polled it, and then some people wanted it to be unlimited again. Stating that the fact that you have to spend so many millions to get the bloody cape you might as well have a good perk from it. I would say this developer blog is fairly good. I like everything in it. There's nothing I have a huge objection against. As always, when I'm going through the other questions, it's very hard to go into specific details about every little thing. So I just try and just go through them, and then when the poll comes out, I will go over them in a lot more detail. However, again, there are always a few questions which I just think, huh, why? Why are they adding that? Or why would anyone want that? But then there's also many questions which I think, that sounds like a wonderful quality of life update that we're all going to love. And I must say, of the other questions, they're all updates that I think we will all like. The odd one that I think might be a bit strange, or the odd one which I didn't even realise was an issue. For example, the trouble brewing flags being two-handed, being changed to one-handed. All in all, very nice developer blog, and I can't wait for the poll on Thursday. 
If you want to discuss this developer blog, please go on the forums or do so in my comments below. It's very important that we can get as much feedback to the Old School Rescape team as possible for them to improve their ideas. If you want to watch my video on the latest Old School Rescape poll, please click here for more brave rewards. And if you want to watch my video on the latest Old School Rescape update, please click here for Last Man Standing and Quality of Life. If you've enjoyed this video, please like and share, and if you want to keep up to date with the Old School Rescape updates, their blogs and polls, please subscribe. I've been Lewis, thanks for watching, goodbye.